On behalf of Shanna Dearden, I welcome Ms. Catherine McGuinness to the House. Ms. McGuinness has been invited to address the Shanna on the topic of children's, children's rights in Ireland. As chair of the External Assessment Panel for Children's Rights Alliance report card, she is to the fore in advocating the changes necessary to secure the rights of children in Ireland by seeking the full implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The address by Ms McGuinness today is very timely, coinciding as it does with the publication of the Shannon Public Consultation Committee of, his, of its report on Ireland's compliance with the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Some of the recommendations of the Committee's report echo comments made in the Children's Rights Alliance report card for 2014. I am sure that today's proceedings will offer an opportunity for dynamic engagement on these matters of common concern. Although Ms. McGuinness, Ms. McGuinness's address today focuses on her work in relation to children's rights, members scarcely need to be reminded of her long and illustrious career. During a multifaceted career in law, Ms. McGuinness practised at the bar and served as a judge of the Circuit Court, High Court and Supreme Court. She was adjuncted Professor of Law at NUI Galway and has been President of the Law Reform Commission. Ms McGuinness was, of course, also a legislator, having served three terms in the Shannon as a representative of the University of Dublin. In a sense, we are welcoming her back here today. Her contribution to public life has also been made during, during her service on a wide range of public bodies. Ms McGuinness is also a member of the Council of State for the second time. Some change has, of course, taken place in this House since she last served here. The spirit of reform, which has both enthused and challenged us, has been given some substance by a number of changes to our procedures. Not least of these is the procedure by which the Shannon may invite persons in public and civic life to attend and be heard in the House. It is this procedure which has facilitated today's address, and I have no doubt that the discussion with Ms McGuinness will prove its value. Again, I would like to welcome Ms Catherine McGuinness and invite her to address Shanna there. Here, look, and Senators, I'm very much honoured to have been invited to address this House today on the theme of children's rights in Ireland. May I also say that it is a very happy occasion for me to return to this familiar and beautiful chamber where I spent many happy, if somewhat controversial, days and made many lasting friends among senators of all political views. The theme of this address is one which has received increasing attention in recent years, in particular during the period of the children's rights referendum, now approaching two years ago. In recent weeks, the controversy about mother and baby homes has shown the lack of rights available to children in our past, and I will refer briefly to this later. That very controversy brings me back to the enactment of the Status of Children Act 1987, notably first introduced in the Senate, which legislatively ended the status of illegitimacy. I am proud that this crucial law was enacted not without opposition at the time when I was a member of this House. My own involvement in the issue of children's rights arose firstly in the movement for reform in education during the 1960s and 1970s. In more recent years, the outstanding voice in this area has been the Children's Rights Alliance, as you have already mentioned. I have been happy to assist as an external assessor in the preparation of their annual report card, which surveys the extent to which policy promises concerning children have been fulfilled, and highlights both successes and failures in the light of the standards set out in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. As I am sure Senators already know, and indeed, as you have already said, and especially as Senator Van Turnout is one of your number, the Children's Rights Alliance is a coalition of over 100 organisations working to secure the rights of children in Ireland. The Alliance works for the rights of children using the collective experience and expertise of the member organisations. 
The reason that in this address I want to draw attention to some of the issues covered in the Alliance report cards over the years since 2009 is that both in its research and in its conclusions I have found the report part card process fair, balanced and evidence-based. Too much commentary on public issues lacks these qualities. The report card is intended to reflect the reality of children's lives and the influence of decisions taken at national and policy level on how their rights are respected or fulfilled, or not as the case may be. In surveying issues concerning children in Ireland in 2014, it is important to give praise where praise is due, as well as to seek change where it is needed. Over the years, the balanced approach of Children's Rights Alliance in the report card process has been recognised by those who work in government departments, so that public servants are now willing and helpful in providing the evidence necessary to give a proper assessment. An atmosphere of trust has grown up, so that there is no need for a defensive response on either side. This adds very much to the credibility of the evidence provided. At this point, I will pause briefly to pay tribute to the highly important work done by Minister Frances Fitzgerald during her time as Minister for Children. I do not need to go into detail. To have laid the foundations for the new Agency for Children and Families is tribute enough. I congratulate the new Minister for Children, Minister Flanagan, on his appointment and welcome his stated determination to complete the crucial programme of legislation which is current in his department. Though perhaps at the moment he might be said to have had to jump in at the deep end. Government actions and policies which attracted praise and encouragement in the 2014 report card included the establishment of the Child and Family Agent, Agency, the proposed free GP care for children under six as a step to universal health care, the provision of funds for school building and the improvements in child literacy, the movement towards change in the patronage of national schools is also welcomed, as is the closing of St. Patrick's Institution and the positive steps taken to improve the conditions of children in detention. It was felt that Budget 2014 was fairer for children than some previous budgets and that good progress had been made on area-based childhood programmes. The extent of childhood poverty remained, however, a considerable concern, as did youth homelessness. Today, however, I would like to highlight the two groups of children that attracted the lowest grades for the government in the report card. The first group is the children of the travelling community, which was marked with an E grade. Outcomes for traveller children are almost universally worse than those of settled children. Many traveller children live in conditions that are far below the minimum required for healthy child development, and this is reflected in their general health throughout their lives. In the 2011 census, it was shown that although virtually all traveller children were enrolled in primary school, which is of course good, 55% of these children had left education by the age of 15, nearly five years earlier than the average in the general population. <coughs> the percentage of travellers with no formal education in 2011 was 17.7%, compared with 1.4% in the general population. Access to education is vital for this group of children. Yet in budget 2011, virtually all the teacher supports for travellers were simply abolished. And this action by the previous government has not been reversed by the present government. Discrimination against and bullying of traveller children is more common than among other children. While we are contemplating the sins against the children of the past, we need to remember the needs and rights of these children of the present. The second group, one which attracted an actual F or fail grade in the report card, is that of migrant children. In particular, the children of asylum seekers living in what is known as direct provision. Here I should perhaps declare an interest as I am patron of the Irish Refugee Council. I've spoken on this issue on many occasions 
and they've even gone so far as to stand on the steps of the Department of Justice in the demonstration, not perhaps very dignified for a former judge, but I felt very strongly about it. The conditions under which these children live are becoming well known. Perhaps one of the worst aspects is that there is no real possibility of them living in a natural environment with their family. They attend school, but on a total allowance of some nine euros a week, have no resources for the incidental expenses of any normal school child, like school trips or games or anything like that. They may be moved on to a different hostel and to a different school at short notice. I have met and talked with teenagers living in direct provision, whose complaints were not by any means unreasonable. Tomorrow in Temple Bar, in connection with the World Refugee Day, the Special Rapporteur on Child Protection, Geoffrey Shannon, will speak on the reality of child welfare and protection issues which arise for children in the direct provision system. One of the most vivid illustrations of the situation of these children is that in August 2013, Mr. Justice Stevens of the Northern Ireland High Court refused to return a Sudanese refugee family to this country under the Dublin II regulation because such a return would be contrary to the best interests of the children concerned. We need to realise what a disgrace to us all this decision implies. I have earlier said that the Children's Rights Alliance surveys policies and outcomes in the light of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. This is the basic international standard. This convention was adopted by the UN in 1989, following a 10-year drafting process, and came into force in 1990. It is the most highly ratified instrument in international law, having been ratified by every member of the UN except Somalia and the United States. Ireland ratified the convention without any reservation on the 28th September 1992. But due to our dual system under Article 29 of the Constitution, it is not yet part of Irish domestic law. This is despite the fact that the text of the recent referendum relied considerably on the Convention. The UN Convention, however, is becoming more influential in the work of our courts, especially in the area of hearing the voice of the child, which is stressed in European child law as well as in Article 12 of the UN Convention. This can be described as using the Convention as soft law. In this particular area, there is a need to reassess the role in our courts of the guardian ad litem, who has the dual role of expressing the wishes or voice of the child and of recommending what is best for the child. At present, our statute law governing the role and appointment of guardians ad litem is in part vague, in part relevant to the criminal justice system only, and in part enacted by the Oireachtas, but not yet brought into actual effect. The choice and appointment of guardians is purely at the discretion of the presiding judge. The quality of the guardians and the amount of their payment varies, but it is accepted that the system is becoming a very expensive one and not a very satisfactory one. There is an urgent need for new and clear legislation in this area and for the establishment of a regulated and trained panel of guardians. We need go no further than Northern Ireland for a good example. Such action would result not only in a better service, but also a probable reduction in the overall cost. The legal system as a whole, however, I believe that it is more than time for Ireland to bring the UN Convention home into our domestic law. Before I conclude this address, I would like to make a brief reference to the planned Commission of Inquiry into Mother and Baby Homes, and perhaps into a wide range of other institutions. I have no difficulty in empathising with the many individuals who have told their stories to radio programmes and elsewhere. I can well understand the need for certainty of identity. And I speak from a background of knowledge, as I was a member of the Adoption Board during the, most of the 1970s, and thus was in close contact with the pressures of poverty, social as attitudes and over-persuasion that forced unmarried mothers to give up their children. 
I also knew the careful assessment of prospective adoptive parents. In the present tidal wave of publicity, one of my fears is that a grey shadow is being cast over these very adoptive parents, ignoring the deeply loving upbringing they have given to their children, who love them in return. I know also that, whatever about earlier times, during that period of the 1970s, the then Registrar of the Adoption Board, Tom Wolfe of GAA fame, left no stone unturned in preventing illegal adoptions wherever they were found. A few weeks ago, before the media attention to the Tuam home arose, I was asked to address the central charity organisation, The Wheel, on the subject of restoring trust. In the course of my address, I said, our present lack of trust in a number of areas in Irish life stems, I believe, from the manner of our response to the various crises which have beset our public life. Whether through bel the belated disclosure of information or through the action of whistleblowers, an area of wrongdoing in public or personal life, present or past, comes to light. Politically and through the media, a crisis is declared and there is an immediate rush to attribute blame either to individuals or to an organization. Often there is little sign of balance, either in the hunt for scapegoats or in the actions that follow. Hysteria reigns in the more co colorful aspects of the media and political grandstanding win wins much desired publicity for more colorful political figures. This is followed by declarations of the need to take instant action often in reality by setting up an inquiry of some kind. There may indeed be a start on remedial action. The difficulty is that after a time, the media frenzy dies down and the inquiry takes time to make its findings and recommendations. By that time, the will to change has considerably dissipated." End of quote. This may be a bit unfair, but does it sound familiar? A recent study by Dr. Helen Buckley of Trinity College analyzed all the inquiries concerning children from the Kilkenny incest inquiry onwards. This demonstrated how few of the recommendations over the years had been fully carried into effect. In the present circumstances, I fully accept the need for an inquiry and the need to assist those who wish to ascertain their original identities and tell their stories. Already there is in existence a great deal of relevant written material held by the HSE and by local authorities, both of whom appear to be ready to provide this documentation for analysis. Much of the period of time which an inquiry would cover is within living memory. It is, for instance, notable that journalists of, if they will forgive me, more senior years have provided a much more balanced commentary on the reality of Ireland both yesterday and today. These are people who, like myself, can remember the times before vaccination or antibiotics, when children died of diphtheria and scarlet fever, when outbreaks of measles raced through schools and institutions, and families died one by one of tuberculosis. The times when there was no welfare payment to enable an unmarried mother to keep her child. We are also able to remember that it was not the nuns who pushed the unmarried pregnant girls out of sight. Inquiries can consume a considerable amount of resources. This state continues to be very short of resources, and the idea of seeking more resources from the taxpayer is distinctly unpopular. In providing the needed inquiry into the mother and child homes, my hope is that the minister and the government as a whole will think very carefully about what are its real priorities in the terms of reference, and will direct the proposed inquiry in accordance with the principles of the Children's Rights Alliance report card, fairly, with balance, and firmly relying on established evidence. Finally, if resources are needed for this necessary inquiry, let us be quite certain that those resources are not taken from the children that are alive and with us today. For example, from the resources of the Department of Children or of TUSLA, the Child and Family Agency. In the final outcome, I feel that the real priority is today's children and their rights. Just as we sit in judgment on our forebears, it is certain that we too will be judged on our response to today's children. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Hildegard Nocton. Thank you, Carhir Look, and I would like to very much welcome the former uh, distinguished jurist and senator to the House today. Of course, Judge McGuinness has a litany of other qualifications and has held many positions of both authority and influence, any of which we could happily discuss here today in this House. However, there is one experience that I would particularly like to deal with. Um, and you made reference to that in your address this morning. Uh, members will be aware that Judge McGuinness was the sole member of the tribunal into what was known at the time as the Kilkenny incest case. Her report was a classic example of clarity and made, for very, co made very cogent recommendations, the most important of which, in my view, was recently put to the people and passed in the form of the children's rights referendum. I would like to take the opportunity to thank you for campaigning on that specific issue I know the term campaigning is not a term that 